these 35, 40 minutes, I'm basically gonna go through some of my own experience using the Meteor framework and try to give an introduction to it. This is largely geared as a intro to Meteor if you've heard about it but haven't seen it before. I'm not a core developer on Meteor, but I've been using it in my consulting practice for about the past year and a half. So I wanted to give some examples and do a live coding and show where do I think this has gone well and where do I not feel so confident with it. So I wanted to give a quick snapshot of what Meteor is. Who here has heard of it before? And who, who here has heard of it and has anyone here used it before? Okay, so I'm gonna put up just one condensed slide on what Meteor is. It'll be a little buzzwordy, and then we're gonna spend the next 40 minutes like looking at what does that actually mean and unpacking that. So the things you hear a lot about when you hear about Meteor So it's running JavaScript everywhere. It's running it on the client. It's running it on the server. And it's running inside of Node. The writing style is a bit different than Node, but one of the nice things about this is that you only need to master JavaScript to get some fluency in client-side and server-side operations. We use client-side rendering, so when we send things from our database onto our web page. We're not sending a whole chunk of HTML. We're just sending the data we need. And our DOM will automatically re-update on those changes. Client subscribe, servers publish. So this is kind of just a language overview. And in part, I'm putting up this slide just so you can see the words. But we're really gonna look at this through example. So the first example that I want to share is a project that myself and a few other people just finished at a museum in California. And the contract was, it's a genetics exhibit. And the gist of the exhibit is you take a plate of bacteria, those bacteria then get genetically engineered, and they glow different colors depending on what you put in the bacteria. So the exhibit, they wanted to run this for a number of months, and they wanted to have some sense of not just going to the museum and doing your experiment on your own, but having a collective sense of over the past three months, what colors show up more, what colors show up less, given the medium, given the camera, given the computer vision processes, what do we end up collecting more or less of as a large group experiment. So in Meteor, one of the things that we did was we built a visualization. And the idea of this visualization is it's basically a take on the kind of ordinary color wheel. And it's showing we're using area to map to how many bacteria we found over the course of the whole exhibit. So when you go into the exhibit, you see this projected up on a wall. If you're a participant, probably a kid, you go, you make your bacteria, you put it under a camera, you take a photo, computer vision runs and counts up how many colors of what kinds were found, and then it adds it, it adds it in here, and so we see everything get larger for a bit. It becomes a bit easier to sense out what got changed. And then the recent changes are flashing. In this demo here, because I recently added in all of that data, it's all flashing. But if it was your experiment, you would just see the relevant sectors changing. So the reason that we use Meteor for this, and to come back to that kind of high level language around what is the advantage of Meteor in this context, the reason that it felt like a nice project is that we've got two systems interacting here. We've got our camera, which takes our Petri dish, photographs it, sends that to computer vision, and makes an analysis. That's saving in a database. This visual is also reading off of a database. But one of the great things that we get is for any of the stations, there's about three in this exhibit, if any of them 
have a kid go through, take the picture. Once that database change happens, the way that Meteor works is that we get essentially for free a way for this visualization to automatically update and kick off a new animation process on those changes. So the real time nature of this between multiple clients all listening to the same database was something that we wanted because in this exhibit, we wanted to give individuals the sense of you did this experiment as part of a larger group and we want those results to render as soon as the database has them. As soon as we can use them, we want to re-render this database here. So that's just one example that I wanted to give. The heart of what I want to go over is I want to share this example here. So you can go to this URL, color-magic.meteor.com. I think it will, I think currently it is only bound for laptops. I don't think that touch or tap events will work on it. But this app here, it's a very simple interactive drawing app. And when I click on it, I'm adding in colors. And if I create a new window, No internet? Poor internet. Poor internet, okay. Well, if I could go to the same URL a second time, I could start drawing it and see those changes populate almost instantly here. I'll leave this up and try this again in a little bit. Great, okay. Um, okay, so if you can see it on your own machine, you can see that when people are drawing on this, those updates will render on your client almost instantly. And this is another illustration of a neat example with Meteor where it's straightforward to bind these individual cells to a database entry, which is just keeping track of where is that cell and the color, and have that populate down to all of the clients that are connected to it. So the heavy lifting here is done by Meteor, and I'm not having to write listener logic or update logic or re-rendering logic. I'm just able to, through event bindings, when I click somewhere, kick off a database process, and because of how this template is bound to my database, Meteor handles the rest of the work of filling in styles dynamically based on people changing different elements. I want to try it one more time. Okay, great. So, so as people draw on it, great. So we can see that there's at least someone else connected to this who's drawing along, as well as myself. And all of this, all of that interaction between multiple users is happening fairly effortlessly, thanks to the work that Meteor is doing under the hood. So if you want to check out the code for this, it's at my GitHub page. So my username is mpnagel. Color-magic is the repo. We're gonna go ahead and live code this right now. 
I put that up there in case you're curious just to look around on your own and see what's happening there. But together, we're going to walk through, from Meteor's perspective, how does this work? And then we'll unpack some of those larger ideas around what does it mean that these templates are bound to a database. So I'm starting with a stub Meteor project. And this is pretty close to what Meteor gives you as its default beginning project. To walk through it and just point out what's here and the couple of additions that I've made into it. So we've got our head section. I've just added in a little bit of CSS inside of the head to make our grid display nicely. Meteor uses templating, and it uses the handlebars-like syntax to include templates. So all that's going on in this line here is we are going to include the template grid to be filled out here inside of the body. And so HTML-wise, all that we're ever going to do is fill out grid, populate that in the body, and that will be the end of our HTML side of this. We're going to go as far as generate the grid itself in the JavaScript side, find the events there, and save the database entries there. So on the JavaScript side, we've got three things to start with. Up here, I'm just putting down an array of colors that we're using in the actual demonstration project. Just pick them out in advance. They're 20. They look good. That's straightforward. And then we've got two sections down here. We've got code for if Meteor is running on the client, on our browser, and if Meteor is running on our server. So this is going back to that idea of we've got JavaScript running everywhere, and we're able to run code that's client side as well as server side. In a larger project, we would break these out into separate folders. For the sake of this demonstration, we can use the conditions, Meteor is client and Meteor is server, and demonstrate whether or not code is client side or server side based on these conditions. So to start with, We're going to define a new Meteor collection. And a Meteor collection is the way that we get a JavaScript object that's bound to a collection in our database. Meteor right now is set up to use MongoDB. In the future, it will bind to other databases. They started with Mongo because documents in Mongo look so close to JavaScript objects that that was a very natural mapping. So this line here just instantiates a new collection in our Mongo database and gives us a JavaScript object that we can use to go back and forth with that collection. So we get that binding virtually for free. So going into our client side code, if we take a step back and just think about what's the pseudocode breakdown for our grid, we can say that when we start, we're picking a color for our user. We've got a grid. Events are kicked off, which are going to get saved in our database. And when we click, we're either making an insert or we're going to remove the entry at that cell. So just to start with picking a color, So meter.startup launches, in this case, when the client first accesses the initial app. So this line here 
Session is a Meteor store. It's a Meteor reactive data source. And one of the ways that Meteor attempts to create very quick, very engaging experiences is through reactivity. And reactivity basically boils down to when you have reactive data that's in a reactive container, whenever that data changes, all the computation that depends on that data will change. So session is a very quick way of saying, I want to store a color for this client session. It's not on the server. It's not in the database. And this block right here is just indexing into our colors array. And we're randomly picking a color out of our array. Get a random number from math.random, multiply it by 20, and then take the floor of that to make sure it's a real number and a real index. So this is effectively saying, pick a random number and save it in our session. So our next step is making a grid. So Meteor gives us a global template object. And we saw in we saw in our HTML that we've got a template. We named it grid. And on the JS side, we can access that by doing template.grid. And then we can create helper functions, which we can call from the HTML side. So here, we're basically making a block of HTML dependent on our size. And we've got two for loops. We're first iterating through and creating a new row for every pass of the outer loop. And then within the outer loop, within each row, we're going to create an individual cell, an individual TD tag, we're creating an ID, and that ID is effectively the coordinates of where we are in the outer loop and the inner loop. We're going to save that ID, and then we're going to set the background color depending on a function that we're going to add in right after this that determines the color of that cell. So since we don't have a function for color right now, and we don't have anything saved. We have no way of keeping track of color. We're going to add in a default function here. So we want template.grid.color to eventually read the color from the database. Since we don't have anything that's inserting into our database as of yet, we're just for now going to say, make everything white. And then we'll figure out what to do with that later. So our last step we're going to do before we should be able to see a grid is one of the advantages of defining template.grid.gridmaker is this creates a helper function that we can then call from our templates in the HTML side. So using a handlebars like syntax, we can call template.grid.gridmaker. We can give it a size, let's say 20. So now if we save both of these, let's see if this is working. Fifty sixteen. okay. Oh, I think it doesn't like. Yeah, OK. For some reason, it doesn't like the way that when I copy and paste in quotes, it can't read that. So if I go to localhost 3000, so 
I just get an ordinary grid. There's no event bindings as of yet. There's no database savings. We just have a grid, 20 by 20, that's being saved. So our next tasks now are to write some events so that we can save a color to a certain location, bind that to our events, and then replace our color function. And that should give us the interactive demo that we saw at the beginning. So we're gonna jump into meteor.isserver right now. Meteor.methods is a way for us to define remote methods on our server that we can call from our client. We're gonna define an add method here and a remove method. And the add method is basically a database insert, which is inserting where we are. And remember, we assigned the IDs on that grid to the coordinates. And we're gonna take a color. If we're deleting an entry, we don't need the color, we just need to know what's the ID of it, and we can delete it that way. Meteor actually lets you make database calls from client side or from server side. In this way of doing it, we're gonna do it on the server side. You have to write a set of allow rules for figuring out what database operations should be allowed on the client, depending on who the user is or other security logic that you want to have happen. So it's not necessarily necessary to make a method here, but it's a reliable way of doing it. Game.insert and game.remove, Mongo operations on our game collection, are also defined functions on our client, and there's two ways of working with it there. This will suffice for us, though. So we have two methods. We wanna make an event binding now so that when we click, we're able to call those methods. So template.grid has dot events. Dot events takes an event map. That map maps a traditional JavaScript or jQuery event plus a selector, in this case a tag name or a CSS selector. We've got a function which takes an event, and here we're getting the target, we're getting what we clicked on in that event. And then current game is being set to the database entry corresponding to that particular cell. So we're using this game object here, running dot find on it, and then we're taking out, we're looking for the index of the ID of that cell that we're looking at. And we're using dot fetch to return that. This new section right here is basically just logic to say, if there was something that we just got back from looking for any database oper any database entries that correspond to that cell, then we're gonna call remove. We're gonna pass in that current ID. If there wasn't anything there, then we're gonna call add, and we're gonna make an insert. We're gonna insert with the same ID, and we're gonna use our session, session store to get the color. So at this point, we've got a grid. We've got ways to save into our database and remove from it. We've got a way to call those server procedures with an event handler. The only thing we need to do now is instead of by default setting the color to white, we want to make sure that this color here listens to our database. So I'm gonna replace this old function. And now we're gonna use the logic of getting back the current cell, 
by again making a database call, this time client side. So we're gonna find the cell that corresponds to that ID. And then if that cell, if there is something to that cell, return its color, otherwise return the default of white. Okay, so with both of those saved, doesn't look like there's any errors. We'll find out soon. So now we see that same behavior working. And Meteor sets this address to automatically listen to changes in the app. So I didn't actually have to refresh it to see this new state. If I'm a second client, I can draw on this. And we can trace through what's happening now. I'm clicking. That's firing our event handler. The logic client side is saying, if there isn't anything there, then make a database call, save your ID, store that color. If there is something there, find that ID and remove it. And the work of connecting this common database across multiple clients is part of the architecture of Meteor. So in that whole process, I didn't have to write any logic that specifically handles updating or re-rendering. If I wanted to put tighter rules on which clients get which information, I could do that. At present, I want all clients to be able to see this full board, and I don't need to add a second layer of rules on top of that. So as a last step, Right now, Meteor makes it straightforward to deploy things on their test servers as a quick way of testing things out. So later, it'll be straightforward to deploy to Meteor's architecture in a production grade way. While that's not available currently, they do have architecture set up for simply testing something, being out in the wild, and they're working on a solution that scales well. So when this is done uploading, we can check out this URL and just see if that coding ended up working. While this uploads, I'll stop here. Oh, let's see. So if we go to poweredbyjs.meteor, Dot com. We see the same app. It's still working. And then any other clients can go to that same address, and we'll see that same behavior at this URL. OK, that's all for my presentation. Are there any questions either about what I just did or Meteor more broadly? Hmm. Um, yeah, I know that um, there are a lot of bindings written internally so that when a Mongo update is detected, then events get triggered and fire on the back end. So I think that Meteor is written in a way where you can swap out Mongo for something like Redis or SQL but those bindings are not yet in a production grade stage. They exist. So you could find a way to do it, but it would probably require some DIYness to it. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, um, I think the best resource that I know about for learning Meteor is there's an online book, Discover Meteor. And this, I think, by far is the best starting resource. Meteor is a little inscrutable, I think, at first. It's a little hard to quite, at least for me, it was a little hard to quite model my head around what's happening. And I think one of the challenges of it not yet being at 1.0 is there's not quite the ecosystem of blog posts and good tutorials out there. This is, I think, a very well-written tutorial and really goes through all of the basics. And it's been out for about a year, but they continue to update it. And they'll keep updating it until the official 1.0 release of Meteor, which is expected to be sometime in 2014. So there are other resources out there. Um, there's a Google group, Meteor-Talk, which is a discussion list. And there's, an, a, there's a video series called Event in Mind. But both that discussion group and this video series, I think, are assume a, that you've already had some time playing with Meteor. I think Discover Meteor, though, does a great job of starting from zero. Of I haven't seen this before. I just want to get going with it. And I would say this is probably the best starting point. Like, why would I use, why would I use or not use Meteor? Um, so one example I can give of another project that I built in Meteor that felt well suited to it was for a while in Los Angeles, I worked for this company, Stadio, and they build a mobile app which you use it in a stadium, and the idea is it's an in-person network where you can talk to other people at the game. The team can push notices down to you, and there's the goal of being able to integrate with the food aisle so that someone's not waiting for 20 minutes at a game. They can go, they can make their order, that happens. So we built this in Meteor, and we basically built an HTML5 app that was correctly sized. And the thing that was really great about Meteor for this was if you had two users side by side, Meteor does a good job of making the interaction as close to real time as possible. So it both makes these round trips of server to client pretty painless for the developer, but it also has some techniques where it will try to simulate on the client what it thinks should happen, and then when the server round trip comes back, it'll invalidate that. So the net effect of that is that sometimes Meteor apps can feel really fast like a desktop app. So for this kind of social app, lots of people on it at the same time, that was great. We got that real-time interaction quite easily. I would say places where I think this makes less sense, um, I personally think one of Meteor's strengths is that real-time interaction and being able to get that fairly effortlessly. I think there are times where the ecosystem of Meteor, so it's built in Node, the packages that you have access to are determined by NPM. That's growing rapidly, but sometimes there's a project where you need to be able to talk easily to Ruby or Python. And at least for a project I'm currently working on where the client has a FileMaker database, and somehow we have to get that talking to the web. I haven't seen a quick way through Meteor of calling out to a different language and doing that. There are ways to do it, but it's just felt easier to not have the structure on top of that when I could write a straightforward web app and a different language. So I think I think of this as a strength when 
there's a real-time interaction. And personally, I haven't found a great way to spawn off other processes that feels worth it if I'm not getting something that's special out of this. So that's, that's my own experience with when I have and haven't used it. Mm -hmm. Like, if there's, like, a huge amount of requests, then if there's not a, how to put it, like, if there isn't some logic that's saying, this is the state that you should be showing, if it's just changing really fast, will a user sort of see that and say, like, this is not consistent or it doesn't make sense as an experience? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the the largest user base that I've worked with Meteor for is this Stadium application, where there were a couple hundred people connected at the same time. So, and there the main interaction mode was people are putting comments or people are putting new posts. So it's not super rapid fire. My hunch is that one of the thoughts you'd have to have is if you had, like in that drawing app, if you had many, many people on it at once, you would probably on the server need to write something where you're sort of saying, okay, how do I take in all of these requests and send out one per second or something of that nature? But I think you'd have to, if I understand your question right, I feel like you'd have to watch for that case and then add in some client or server side logic that says, okay, this is how you handle all of those requests coming in. But yeah, I could see I could see that being an issue. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that question makes sense to me. Having not dug into it deeply myself. I don't have a great, this is how I would handle it, but my first thought would just be thinking about how would you write throttling or limiting logic on the client or the server to integrate out in the way that you want to. Okay, so I'll stick around for a few more minutes if there are any more questions about Meteor, but otherwise, thanks for coming.